So if you'd like to uh, find your spots and get settled in, a um, couple of things. Um, I've already handed out to some. If you missed it, uh, I've got them sitting up here. They're the homework sheets. Those are for next week. And so you don't have to start working on it right now. Uh, but I will explain it a bit as we go through the study. And at the end, I'll remind you as to what the uh, homework responsibilities are. Um, if you need help or have extra questions about them, just talk to me and I'll try my best to explain it uh, a couple weeks going through. Um, right up here. Alan's now in charge of the handouts, and so he can hand them out to everybody else. Who needs a handout? Raise your hand. Right handle. Problem solved, problem staying solved. All right, let's start our class with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of time shared and study. We thank you for our safe assembly this morning, and we pray that our study is beneficial to us and our worship is um, a blessing to each other and to you. And we offer this prayer in your son's name. Amen. All righty then, uh, as noted, we are in lesson two, uh, if you will, in our series of studies. Early on, they're going to follow the numbering system inside that book from the Waldrons. But as we go through the year, we're going to get a little faster pace than they have them broken out there. Um, a couple of good reasons for it, but the bottom line is um, that's the pace we're going to keep. So you'll note that changing. That's already in the schedule. So as it's laid out inside your schedule that I gave out last week, um, it lists all of those details. This morning, we're taking a look more in depth to the area called Palestine or Israel or Canaan or the promised land. Those are four terms that will be kind of dealt with in detail inside our study for today. Um, we're going to do so making sure we make connections to the biblical text, reaching out a little bit into archaeology and history, and trying to make this as, uh, I'll say a lot during the course of this particular study, sticky. Um, I'm someone who has to write things down to remember them. Not just type them. If I really think it's important, i got to take my hand with whatever penmanship I can muster and write it down. Um, I don't know what it is for me. That's the way I remember stuff. I then also set a reminder uh, to make sure that the reminder tells me to remember to do the thing. Uh, but um, I think that's an important part of study and learning is to try to figure out what it takes for you to remember a thing. Because what works for me absolutely may not work for you. You may need an entirely different method to make something stick. Um, and so we're going to employ a number of the various ways we can, help, we can find to make that goal um, met for each of our participants in our class. Um, another thing, I didn't show this last week. I'll probably show it a couple other times. Uh, you'll see this a little bit. This is a cross-section of um, the area of Israel, kind of showing us some of the topography in different ways. In this case, it shows the highs and the lows. Um, we'll bring it up when we're doing our historical surveys because these elevation um, details inform us about what's going on in a story. There are two easy ways to think about this. If you tell someone you're going up the road, what exactly might you mean by that? North, North right? Or your road may go two directions and you're looking away and you go, I got to go up the road to see my friends. All right. Those are accurate statements that vary on the basis of who's saying it and what's going on. So you can go up to Jerusalem in two different ways. You can go elevation up to Jerusalem, and that happens in the Bible story. And you can go up to Jerusalem by going the ordinal north, just going straight north. Paying attention to that detail can shift two things for us. For us, who already believe in the Bible story, um, we can now have a better picture of what's going on. 
there is a subset of people you will meet that because they see these apparent discrepancies in their minds in the Bible story, they'll say, well, the Bible's not accurate. Because is the Bible north saying Jerusalem's to the north? Or is the Bible saying something else? And so this will give you the tools you need to say, hey, wait a minute. Maybe you're not reading carefully. Maybe you've heard someone tell you something that's not accurate. This is the land. And so when they said this, they did actually mean they went up to Jerusalem because they went up to Jerusalem. And so it's just a good tool to have um, at times when you're having um, Bible studies with folks. Um, so narrowing in to this area called, for our purposes early on, Palestine. But we're going to actually explain a bit about where that name comes from. Um, and that's important because it does actually appear in some translations of the Bible. Um, but the earliest one we really find is the term Canaan. Uh, Canaan is applied to this area, this region, if you will. Um, early on in the Bible story, most notably in Genesis 10, but also in Genesis 12, right? And what takes place in Genesis 12? What's something we remember maybe from our sermon last Sunday? What's a, uh, what was it last Sunday? Yeah, last Sunday. What's a big thing in Genesis 12 with one of the patriarchs? He's got a name and it changes like many of them do. Abraham, right? Abram. Or in the Hebrew, it's Abram uh, who becomes Abraham. Um, and uh, we have all of the pledges or promises that are made. This is the early versions or dropping of this. And there's four big statements with a couple of secondary statements. But Canaan re reappears a couple of other times all the way through um, judges. Uh, and so Canaan kind of it gets used interchangeably to describe this area. And Genesis 12 is where we see a shift. The shift takes place in Genesis 12. Um, when we have a, we can talk about it as a prophetic title taking place or a theological concept taking place. Because now it's referred to as the promised land. When you read promised land, and two passages come into mind, obviously Genesis 12, which I already mentioned, but also Genesis 15, what kind of ideas do you have come to the surface when we refer to this region of dirt, if you will, as the promised land? Land flowing of milk and honey. Land flowing of milk and honey. We talk about promised land into its promised blessings, perhaps. What else? Seems far off. Yeah, that's like the promised land. Well, it's not my current land, but it's been pledged or promised somehow, but it's over yonder. There's some distance there. That distance can be physical. That distance can be time-based. It's a future thing. By the way, do we sing still about a promised land? Um, there's a phrase I heard, I think it was last year for the first time, uh, that I think has some value to toy with, to think about. That is, um, Christianity could be considered born out of um, Judaism or Israel. That's a, that's a fair statement. It's not universal, like it's always that way, but it's something to think about. Because some of these phrases, because of the nature of the interplay between the covenant and Christ, just move right in. All right? And there's another one we're going to pay attention to in a second. So we have promised land talking about the promised blessings. We have promised land talking about its future tense, either in space or in time. What else? Is there anything else? I got the easiest one of all then. It was promised land. That this is part of the covenant with Abraham. Uh, it was pledged to them. It was to be owned in the context of the covenant. And so those three ideas, maybe a few more, can fit in there. The next term that gets applied to this area also has some interesting connections for us. All right, so uh, it's called the land of Israel, right? That's another, we call it Israel 
uh, as a uh, colloquial or short form. Um, but have you ever stopped to think about this event that takes place in Genesis um, regarding uh, Jacob's name change? What's going on there, uh, there in Genesis uh, when we get this change of name for Jacob to Yisrael or Israel? What's the event? What's Jacob up to? It's an all-night endeavor for him, right? Yeah, he's wrestling. He's wrestling. Uh, well, described as an angel. A messenger. A messenger. The, the, the textual biblical answer is it's a messenger. As to the details of who and what's going on there, there is some obscurity. Uh, I like to say it maybe sometimes this way. When God chooses to be obscure, and it seems very obvious that he's being obscure, it's a hands-off moment. Let it be obscure. Uh, let the identity of this particular uh, professional WWE wrestler um, go on here. So, do you guys remember or know, it says this in the text, what does Israel as a word mean before it's given as a name to Jacob? It's right there in the text, too, if you dig around and go to Genesis 32, I think it's uh, verse 28. Um, Put your thinkers on, or you can turn your turners on and get there too. Well, we're going to talk about this in detail in a second. Uh, it means he who strives with God. So Israel, before it's given as a name for an entire people, and we'll talk about this in detail in a second, he who strives with God. That's why we have this obscure kind of what's going on with this angel that he's wrestling with, um, all of those details. So that's three big kind of concepts um, that come into play from the biblical text, from antiquity. This is going to the furthest edges of things and in our Hebrew Bible. And so we haven't touched on an additional term just yet, but we'll get to it in a second. Um, that's important for us to keep that in mind. Uh, with these three different terms and the fourth uh, dangling tantalizingly in a second, because the Bible stories will use these phrases interchangeably, sometimes page to page, and we have to pay attention to make sure, hey, what's going on? Where are we? When are we? And what is the context here? Um, it's an important tool, if you will, to read through the maps, read through the details. Now... We have one more term, Palestine, right? Um, Palestine actually is a term that was layered on top of this area that referred geographically to this area. When we use this term in the context of biblical study, we are not referring to, to modern Palestinian governmental context. And the same applies when we talk about Israel in biblical studies. We're not talking about the country that was reestablished or established, depending on your perspective, around the you know, 1940s or so. We're not talking about those British mandates. We're not talking about any of those things. They can be relevant at times when digging through archaeology, but that's not the focus of this kind of concept or terminology. Um, the term here um, for Palestine actually appears in your Bible a couple of times, depending on what translation you're using. Uh, if you uh, Raise your hand if your favored preferred translation is the King James. By the way, it's fine because I love the King James uh, you know, it's not my preferred translation, but I think it's a great translation of the scriptures um, with great value. Um, Bobby uses it, I know, too, right? Yeah. And here's the thing. Um, Melvin Curry told me this a long time ago. It's kind of stuck with me. You are most likely to continue to use the translation you were, I'll use this quotation, baptized into. That is, as a new convert, whichever one you read from the most... 
it probably sticks with you the most. So you're probably going to remember your Bible best in that translation. So it's something, a tool to use to help you remember. Um, but there are a couple iterations that are important. Um, in Exodus 15, Isaiah 14, and in Joel 3, um, the word Palestine appears. Um, but it's really not necessarily referring in that Old Testament context to how we use it now. It's actually referring uh, to Philistia's tiny country on the southern coastal plain. And so it's kind of the origin story for the word that eventually gets flipped into the larger historical spacing. So it's just kind of, you'll see it a lot of maps. You'll see it as Palestine. Uh, it's Philistia. It's another term for it. Um, so that helps us kind of sort all of those things. Note this, at various times, we'll use any of those four terms to talk about the area. We we'll might talk about Canaan if we're talking about Judges uh, or Abraham. We might use Israel if we're talking about the kingdom um, periods, both the united and the divided and then the restored kingdom post-captivity. Uh, we might use Palestine if we're talking about the time of Christ because it's the overarching term used by the Roman context. And so we might use that term. Um, that leads us to another important tool that has theological ramifications, that is God's teaching uh, ramifications, and um, is a kind of a similar concept. And that's dealing with the names for the people of God. Um, knowing where they come from helps us use them appropriately, uh, having that backdrop or context for it. So our first one is our term Hebrew. Um, it's root meaning, stranger or foreigner to a certain degree. Uh, one of the iterations that's applied to is Abraham in Genesis 14. Um, foreign from Ur, dwelling in uh, the Canaanites in Canaan. Um, and his descendants are then called Hebrews. So generic terminology is applied there. Notice that that becomes an umbrella term that holds other things underneath it. And so Hebrew becomes, uh, after its initial arrival, kind of the overarching term for the entire grouping of peoples, independent at times of their spiritual disposition. They can be Hebrews, but unfaithful. Um, and uh, and uh, apostate from the covenant. The next one we've already mentioned, but I want to spend a little time dealing with the detail here. Israelite gets applied post-Jacob. What kind of person do you think you would describe Jacob as if you kind of looked at the sum total of his behavior? Not how God uses him. That's a different context. But how does Jacob behave? How does he get his wife? And you're going to pick the answer to that question. So I use the singular. Right. So there, there's, a, there's a sense of a context or a conflict going on. He believed he was pledged one thing and then he was substituted another thing. Then he had to do it a second time. How did he separate from what seems to be a pretty bad relationship with his two-time father-in-law. Do you guys remember the issue with the cattle? And so he, he turned the tables and created a context where he was able to glean a large amount. Um, by the way, how does Israel leave Egypt? Do they strip the cupboards bare when they leave Egypt? They plundered it pretty good, and to the point where some of them were like, hey, just take it and go away. You know, so there's, there's a whole lot of that going on. So there's an odd kind of repetition of history, <laughs> history there. But I noticed this when I was kind of digging things together for the class. The term there, back, he who contends with God. Think about the relationship that Israel has with Jehovah, 
with Elohim, with Yahweh, all the big uh, titles for God. Do they have a really great relationship together? Uh, Just solid as a rock from beginning to end? It seems that the name Israel, he who contends with God, almost becomes descriptive of how the Israelites behave with God. Constantly murmuring, complaining, and contending with God. Oh, and by the way, when you read Hosea and talk about Gomer and the relationship there that is designed to be typical of the relationship between God and Israel, there's a lot of contention there too. So having that backdrop, he who contends with God, becomes the adopted and intentional name of God's people. In the New Testament, are Christians ever described as Israel? We actually use an accommodative form, spiritual Israel. And we're grafted in. Paul writes uh, to the brethren of Galatia, described using Abraham and Sarah as uh, an illustrative teaching tool with Hagar as another key component. You kind of have that whole story retold again. But in the end, you and I were grafted into the lump that is those who contend with God. It's an interesting theological string that goes from Jacob through a people who behave that way even to us, even though now we have a clear picture of our loving Savior. So as much as we want to describe ourselves as the kingdom of God, as the people of God, as spiritual Israel, and they would describe themselves as the people of God and the kingdom of God, we need to be aware of the origin, if you will, of that term to a, to a small degree. Israel, he who contends with God, becomes those who are God's chosen people, but they got a long history of contending with God. Uh, We've got to make sure that we who now mature into Christ learn to grow out of that history, learn to mature beyond it. One more term that appears, um, and it has multiple modern uses, um, but we're talking right now in the the biblical context. Um, Jude gets applied first under the umbrella first umbrella of Hebrew. So you have all those who are Hebrew in their descendancy from Abraham. Under the umbrella of Israelite, those who are descended of Jacob, same umbrella on top, smaller one now, Israelite, those who contend, he who contends. Now you had a smaller umbrella underneath that referring to Jews. In this case, the southern kingdom, they become emblematic of all of Israel for two reasons. One is the captivity context. When Israel is squished down into captivity, the identity of the tribes is kind of... um, It's not lost, but it's dispersed. Their hold to the land goes away. Their hold to the region goes away. For the covenant's failure on their part, God kept his covenant with them and they received the curses so they didn't keep their land. But that also readdressed how they were going to be referred to because the bulk of those who would still be faithful then got referred to as, well, you're all Jews. You're all part of Judah, as they were perceived. Even if they weren't, even if that was not their tribal context, they are now seen as people who are Jews. At different points in modern history, the terminology Jew has moved into a lot of different uses. Some of them are completely inappropriate. Some of them were historically accurate. But keep in mind, when we use these terms in this study, we're referring to this historical context of God's people post-captivity and the name that is applied to them because of the history of Judah. And so we're using it very specifically in that way. Um, 
Today also, in the most positive sense, it can refer to two areas. I think it's important to note this. You have two classifications of individuals who are referred to as Jews. You have those who are Hebrews, um, who are genetically descended from Abraham, who identify as Jews. And that is genetic physiology. It may or may not have anything to do with the second use of the term Jew or Jewish. Um, because someone can be Jew or Jewish independent of their genetics. Because it also gets applied to those who either because of their birth and their upbringing or by choice adopt the same faith that was held or is held by those various ethnic groups. So it's important to use those terms rightly and wisely. Now, even today, you have individuals who are one, the other, or both. In the first century, you had those who were one, the other, or both. Uh, you think about our Ethiopian eunuch. Is he ethnically Jewish? Is he a descendant of Abraham for anything that we know? Not, not that we can tell, but would he be Jewish in his um, proselyted status? Yeah. So you can be one and not the other, but you could also have someone who was ethnically a descendant of Abraham, who also is part of the faith of Israel. And so that's a pretty familiar thing for us, but we've got to make sure that we class it sometimes because... We'll also encounter people who are ethnically descendants of Abraham who have no interest in following after the faith of their fathers in the Bible story and beyond. Les? I guess uh, Ishmael, I guess, would be an Ishmael. I guess be an example of that. They're descended from Abraham, but yep. I don't recall them ever being classified as Jews. Or... Right. Uh, and there's... Uh, a lot of folks try to work on this, and it's well out of my ability to be specific, but I can tell you this, the entire crescent of the Mediterranean has a lot of a mixture of all of those um, genetic trees. And so that's why if you see someone in the Mediterranean and you're not aware of their cultural mannerisms, you may have no idea where they're from. They, they look like everybody else. Um, I think it was probably most recently around 2000 or so, the U.S. military, because of their work in Afghanistan, a lot of the soldiers started wearing, um, what is it, Shmegas? Shem, Shemgas, I think is one of the names, but it's a kifya, which is the Arabic term for it. And it's basically this kind of scarf thing, all right? Um, well, everybody in the Middle East, for various reasons, wears some variation of a scarf thing. Mostly because it's desert and there's lots of sand and it's hot. And so it solves problems. Well, if you see someone wearing one of those, some of them wear them because culturally they became a sign of rebellion against oppression, against the British mandate. Others wear them because they're practical. And you can actually see people who have divergent cultures and actually might even be at war with one another, both wearing the same cultural scarf. Uh, actually sometimes from the same maker, and the same company made the thing, but two different people are wearing them. So it's important to be able to sort those things out the best we can, uh, both inside the Bible text, like Les is pointing out, but also just as a general tool beyond that. All right, so we're also going to make a note of another detail. Um, I mentioned this a little bit last week. We're going to have a couple of illustrations to put this in context. Um, but the place and setting of Israel is really small, super tiny. Um, relative to the state of Georgia, how big do you think it, physical Israel is at the biggest Solomon level strength? That's pretty close. It's about one fourth, one quarter of Georgia land mass represents Israel as the kingdom of Israel under David and Solomon. All of it's reaching as far as it can go. It doesn't include vassal states that may have paid taxes, but anything that David 
and Solomon claimed as their land. Um, more narrowly, we tend to think of a smaller context, and this tiny little space is about one-fourth the size of Alabama, similar in spacing, although Alabama is smaller a little bit than Georgia is. Uh, like uh, some folks, myself included, Georgia's a little fat around the middle, and so it kind of bumps out a little bit. And so you kind of think of the state that way. Now you know how to pick those states on the line. Um, but we're going to compare this a little bit to some states in the U.S. to kind of get a little picture of things. Uh, so here's Palestine and Alabama kind of laid on top of each other. It's rough, and so the, the scale's not precise here. Uh, I didn't want to spend 25 hours trying to get a precise representation of Palestine slash Israel to Alabama, uh, but I got it close. Um, no state, for those who might have more northern heritage, there's Palestine existing inside Indiana. Here's New Mexico. Uh, for those who have driven across the vast spans of New Mexico, there's Palestine trying to hide inside of it. Um, then we got uh, Palestine hanging out in the panhandle. It's like, okay, now you start getting a little picture of that. Uh, you know, you can spend all day driving in Texas, and you can start in Texas, sleep in Texas, get up and still drive and not leave Texas if you're going across it east to west and driving at the speed limit. You can go across Texas at a faster rate. Um, here's that in regards to the entire United States, and we can kind of see it popping up in our relative pictures there. That kind of helps us a little bit um, to catch these details, to kind of say, okay. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been to Alaska before, uh, Alaska takes up like half of the Western US when you uh, lay it out there. Um, that's even with or without the snow, you know, so it's just massive. Um, and so Alaska's huge by compared to all of this, and so Palestine it, compared to Alaska is like a little pinprick, if you will. Um, Narrowing it down, though, we come back, and this is a map. I think you probably have a similar map, although it's got more detail in your handout for your homework, but it's also in your workbook, too, so if you want to look up close. Dan to Beersheba is 150 miles. How many of you, if I said, hey, we got something really awesome, we got to drive 150 miles, you going to feel bad about that drive? I mean, like, this is the most awesome thing you can imagine. 150 miles, huh, I, I'd do that. How, how long is that in a car ride? A couple hours? Modern, you know, roadway systems? If you're with me, it's probably a two hour plus an hour drive stop at Bucky's. So, you know, you gotta have that timing factor. You gotta stretch your legs, you know? So, uh, 150 miles, all right? A lot of what we read about and consider in the biblical text happens within that 150 mile reach. Um, the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan Valley, 30 miles. Here's something to think about. Let's test your history knowledge. You, your kids get tested on this. Um, what established the dimensions of a county in the state of Georgia? And why do we have so many of them? Day's horse ride. Day's horse ride. That's exactly the correct answer. The bazillion counties we have are established because approximately it's a day's horse ride. Now, how big is a county then? Start thinking in terms. How, how far is it from one edge of Coweta to another? There's a simple hint on the screen, approximately. It's about 30 miles, right? It's about the size of the county. Some counties are bigger, some are smaller. And you know what? You can ride a horse about 30 miles in a day. The horse ain't going to be happy about it at the end of the day, and you're not going to be happy about it in the end of the day, but you're not pushing it too hard. Um, you can walk 12 to 15 miles in a day if it's flat. Um, not a lot of Israel is flat, so you're not going to be doing 12 to 15 miles in a day and be happy about it. But that's a pretty standard rate, especially for those who are good at it. AT hikers do 12 to 15 miles a day pretty regularly. They hike the Appalachian Trail or the PCT. So, perspective here, 150 miles, one direction, 
30 miles going from the Jordan to the Mediterranean. Um, Gaza to the Dead Sea. This is Gaza, not some of the other regional things applied to um, Egypt. And so there's actually even the Egypt River down this area too. Um, but that's 50 miles. So like a county and a, and a two-third, if you will, on the bottom edge. The term Canaan really only applied to whatever is to the west of the Jordan River. Because remember, they crossed the Jordan into Canaan. So you can make it stick that way into your thought process. Um, we'll cover this in more detail a couple different times. Also note this. Um, the water that flows into the Dead Sea flows mostly from two sources. How does the Dead Sea get that water? Jordan, the Jordan comes down from Galilee. By the way, in our songs, day by day, it flows from life to death. There's one of these great songs uh, in our songbooks that makes play over this whole river uh, circumstance of the Jordan going into the Dead Sea. Second source is all the wadis, all these little tributary rain-fed only streams that appear when God blesses the land. If you travel to Israel today and you go to the Dead Sea, uh, the Dead Sea is surrounded by salt stacks. Um, and so it helps you understand why no one really wants to live outside of modern produce right around the Dead Sea. Because there's, it's just as it, you would think. Ain't nothing growing there. You got to get well out of that region to see it. Um, so thinking about it in parallel terms. Uh, by the way, this is, the, this is a recent photo of the Mediterranean Sea near um, Gaza on our map that we just looked at. And so the nearest point to there, uh, again, about a three hour drive, but in Abraham's time frame, caravan of camels, about five, six days. Anyone want to take that route instead of the car ride? I'm in. I'll, I'll do it. I'll give it a go. Will I be happy about it at the end? Probably, but not physically content. I'll be a little worn out. Camel, camels are, uh, you know, tough beasts. Um, by camel alone, though, because camels don't get tired at the same rate the horses do, you could do it in two days. You just kind of slough along. You just got to got to cling, and they'll keep going. Herdsman, moving a, moving a herd, two weeks. That then will scale how you picture Bible stories. You picture the conflicts and the wars that take place within there. Um, it can then be kind of envisioned as the Atlanta Metroplex. If you take Israel and lay it across the core of the center of um, Georgia, and you think about how we describe someone who's from Atlanta, we got two terms, right? You either say you're from Atlanta, or if the other person is also from Atlanta, then you might use some secondary terms to describe, well, I grew up inside or outside the loop, or you might say, um, I was raised in College Park, or et cetera, and you give more detail. But the region there is pretty clearly identified. Um, for our purposes to kind of catch some details, it's located in an area where major trade routes would cross. It's the connection between the Mediterranean Sea and all the Arabian Desert. Uh, it's a connection of continents. Practically, it seems that God used this location to allow humanity to be aware of him. Sometimes that seems to be highlighted in the prophet's teaching. Um, and the nations around them became the tools God would use to punish them, um, those surrounding powerful nations. Uh, here's a bit of, about the climate. Uh, important detail for us. Um, Joppa averages around 67 degrees. Jerusalem, a little colder. It's a little more elevated. Average temperature, 63 degrees. Jericho, down in the Jordan Valley, that's 15 miles east of Jerusalem and north of the Dead Sea, 110 in the summer. 
Anyone remember what the temperatures can be in Needles, California, or in the area around um, Death Valley? 125. I have driven through and seen the sign at the bank at 133 degrees in Needles, California, visiting my grandmother. Um, so they've got, if you want to think about it in terms of U.S. Um, comparison, a lot of the aspects of the Western states kind of mimic on a much smaller scale inside Israel. Um, Mount Hermon. 9,200 uh, square uh, foot above uh, sea level. Sea, it's snow covered year round. Um, Trey, what's the height of the big uh, mountains there in Colorado? Yeah, the 14, you know, the 1400s, the 14 Kers. Uh, they have most of the tallest peaks in the U.S. I think Mount Whitney on the edge of California is the tallest uh, at like 14 and change, uh, and then the largest ones are up in Alaska for U.S. mountains, but. So that's a few thousand feet difference. Um, if you add in the difference between the base of the Dead Sea all the way up to the top of Mount Hermon, um, you've got, again, representative geography that's similar to a lot of the U.S. as well. Um, narrowing down, we've got a couple more things to look at for this morning in our last two minutes. I'll try to get them in. Um, this is a modern photo of the city of David, uh, which is the center part of Jerusalem. That's the part at which... Jerusalem grows out of. And so Jerusalem grows from the city of David into the metropolis at the different high points. Um, and so you're kind of seeing everything. Uh, for those who have probably seen this on television or in different ways, you got the Dome of the Rock that's located near where the temple would have stood. Now, they're not sort of the exact specific location, but it's basically right on top of the Dome of the Rock to some degree. Uh, the orientation is a little um, unknown exactly, but a lot of the remnants of the expanded temple of the time of Christ are still there, so they can pretty much figure it out. Um, but you can also see a lot of the archaeological spaces off of that, as well as some of the areas we'll look at, and we'll look at them more closely when we get into those historical events. Um, here is Mount Hermon off in the distance. Uh, this is um, looking right here toward the northern tip of Canaan or Palestine. And so we're looking all the way up, if you will. Uh, if you're standing in the Israel space, and you're kind of thinking you're north of Jerusalem here, and you're looking towards Mount Hermon, uh, which is that peak, the tallest spot in that region. Um, it actually has snow skiing there during the, the winter times. Uh, this is also the area that if you wanted to find their best rivers, they're all in Dan. All of the most beautiful rivers in Israel start in Dan and Beersheba up in that area. And we got 16 seconds, so we have to stop right there. At least my watch says that. Um, but I will say this. You have homework between this week and next week. Uh, if you didn't get it, there are copies available up front, and Alan will be happy to hand them out because he got voluntold to the job. Um, there is a sheet of instructions that tells you what to color and how to color it, and then a blank map, and then a reference map in those pages. And hopefully that'll work for you all. If you have questions, let me know. Thanks everybody.